Okay, so hyponatremia is an approach that you're going to be asked time and time again during your rotation because it's so common and you really need to be familiar with it. So let's start with the definition. Hyponatremia is essentially a low sodium concentration. And you should remember the normal value, which is a sodium concentration between 135 and 145. So obviously hyponatremia is less than 135. There's a constellation of symptoms associated with hyponatremia, and in mild cases, you can be totally asymptomatic, or you can have nausea, malaise, dizziness, forgetfulness, or irritability. And moderate cases, they present with confusion, lethargy, and headache. And severe cases, you can have seizures, neurologic deficits, and respiratory arrest. Your symptoms do depend on the chronicity of hyponatremia, meaning an acute change in the sodium concentration will often result in symptoms, but a patient with gradual onset or chronic hyponatremia will often feel totally fine. So the approach that you'll commonly see is one based on volume status, which is the one I'm going to cover. Uh, there's another one based on just ADH, and I'll probably do another video on that. So the approach here is the first step, get a serum osmolality. If you remember from first or second year, the equation is your serum os is your sodium concentration times two plus your glucose plus your urea. You can remember the phrase two salts and a sticky bun if you forget that equation. And you can add the blood alcohol level if it's relevant to your patient. And keep in mind we're using SI units here. And in most cases of hyponatremia, your sodium concentration is going to be low. So, for example, 130. If you plug 130 into this equation, 2 times 130 is 260. And you now realize that for your serum osmolality to be anything but low, your glucose or your urea has to be through the roof. So it's really uncommon to have a serum osmolality that's either high or normal, but it's important to know just for academic purposes. So if it, for some reason, comes back high, so you have hyperosmolar hyponatremia, the possibilities are you'll have hyperglycemia or mannitol or radiocontrast. So for hyperglycemia, you can correct for that by adding 3 to the sodium concentration per increase in glucose by 10. Next, you have a normal serum osmolality, and that's also known as isoosmolar hyponatremia. And the possibilities in this case are periproteinemia and hypertriglyceridemia. And last, we have a low serum osmolality. And this is, again, the most likely possibility, and this is the one you really need to know. Okay, so now that you have hypoosmolar hyponatremia, your next step is to do a volume assessment. So you start with the history. So you can ask them if they've been vomiting, if they've had diarrhea or used diuretics, and also if they have any polyuria. Then you have your physical exam. And you can do vitals, uh, including orthostatic vitals, and then definitely JVP. So JVP is the most important thing to look for. And this is really difficult to do unless you practice with all your patients. Um, ask your attending or your resident to check for the JVP when you see the patient in review so that you can compare your own measurement with theirs. That's really the only way to make sure you get a good JVP every time. The other things you can look for, which are probably not as helpful, include skin turgor, dry axilla, dry mucous membranes, edema, urine output measurements, and also daily weight measurements. All right, so now you've done your history and physical, and hopefully you have a good idea of their volume status. In these next three branches, you'll see um, some conditions in bold. And those are the ones that are most commonly seen in, uh, and commonly uh, the cause of the hyponatremia. So let's start with hypervolemia. Now, if they're hypervolemic, they often have a high JVP and they're going to have pedal edema. Your next step is to do a urine sodium measurement. If your urine sodium is low, uh, which is less than 10, the conditions on your differential should be CHF, 
cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome, and hypoalbuminemia. The problem here is that you have a decreased oncotic force that leads to water being forced into the interstitial space where the sodium content is high. And your treatment of these hypervolemic, um, hyponatremic cases is fluid and sodium restriction. And the other possibility is you do a urine sodium and it comes back high. And that's um, the case of renal failure. And that's a whole approach in itself. And there'll be another video on renal failure. Next, we're moving on to hypovolemic hyponatremia. So these patients are dry. Again, the next step is to do a urine sodium concentration. But here I want to give you a quick physiological explanation. So when the body is in a hypovolemic state, it wants to hold on to as much water as it can. And the way it does that is the kidney reabsorbs the sodium from the urine into the blood and water will follow that sodium into the blood as well. Now in the case when the kidneys are working well and they're reabsorbing sodium, your urine sodium should be low or less than 20. And this means your hyponatremia has to be due to things other than the kidney. Um, so extra renal losses. And this includes diarrhea, vomiting, sweating, third spacing, and burns. And the other case is when your urine sodium is elevated. This means there's a malfunction in the kidney and you have renal salt losses. This is most often due to diuretic use acute tubular necrosis, and low aldosterone states. For hypovolemic hyponatremia in general, the treatment is administration of IV normal saline. And here's just a note that giving IV saline in other cases, which include edematous conditions or hypervolemia, like CHF and cirrhosis, that will worsen these conditions. So you need to be careful on who you give IV normal saline to. And next we have the uvolemic patient. First, a quick review of ADH. So ADH is a hormone, antidiuretic hormone, which inserts acroporins into the collecting duct of the nephron. So the water can move from the urine into the sodium, and the effect is it dilutes the blood. So with uvolemia, your first branch is SIADH, which stands for Syndrome of Inappropriate ADH Secretion. So the body will react by inappropriately secreting ADH in conditions including stress, pain, nausea, drugs, cancer, lung disease, CNS trauma, including skull fractures, and systemic infections. It's really important to remember the conditions that cause SIDH because you will be asked. And the next branch is non-SIADH mechanisms. And these ones, again, you just need to memorize these. So there's psychogenic polydipsia. Often these patients will drink ridiculous amounts of water per day because of an insatiable thirst. And then we have hypothyroidism, adrenal insufficiency, and a low solute diet. The low solute diet is sometimes known as the tea and toast diet. That's common in elderly patients who don't eat a regular diet and they just have tea and toast all day. And it's also known as beer potomania. So this happens in alcoholics who neglect their diet and drink all day. They end up with low solutes and electrolytes. And you need those solutes and electrolytes to excrete free water. So in effect, these patients hold on to free water and they get hyponatremia. Now for euvolemic conditions, your treatment is again fluid restriction and then also treating the underlying disorder. So replace the thyroid um, hormone or give glucocorticoids if they're deficient and resume a normal diet if they have the tea and toast or beer potomania. Now just a really quick side note, the biggest complaint with this volume status approach is that it depends on an accurate volume assessment which is pretty difficult to obtain as a beginner medical student. And that's true, but it gets a lot easier as you practice. So check the JVP with your attending or resident, as I mentioned before, and just make it a routine. One other important to, point to understand is that the treatment of the hypovolemic 
hyponatremia is giving saline, and the treatment of the other ones, which is euvolemic and hypervolemic hyponatremia, is the same. It's fluid restriction. You know, when you put everything into context, including the history and the past medical history of the patient and your lab tests, things should make a lot more sense, and you should be able to just pinpoint what is the cause of the, uh, the patient's hyponatremia. So next, we'll move on to treatment. Okay, so I've already mentioned the main principles of management. One of the things you don't see too commonly is vasopressin receptor antagonists, and they basically block the effect of ADH. And the other option is hypertonic saline, which I'll talk about in just a second here. So before you start the treatment of hypernatremia, you need to try and figure out whether the change from the normal level of sodium to the low level of sodium was acute or chronic, and 48 hours is the arbitrary definition. And if the change was acute, the patient is often symptomatic, and we can consider treatment with hypertonic saline. And that's basically 3% saline. In general, you can raise the sodium by 4 to 6 at a rate of 1 to 2 per hour, and that'll usually resolve the acute symptoms. Monitoring is extremely important, so get the serum sodium every two to four hours. After you've increased the sodium by four to six, then you can follow the guidelines of treating chronic hyponatremia, and that means correcting at equal or less than 0.5 millimoles per liter per hour. And this is to prevent CPM central pontine myelinolysis and that's a delayed presentation of irreversible neurological symptoms it often presents two to six days after excessively rapid sodium correction and that's scary because they might have a normal sodium after correction that we discharged home and then at home they'll present with altered level of consciousness and confusion treatment of cpm is generally supportive and the prognosis is really poor Okay, so that's it, and we'll just do a really quick summary. So remember that the first step of the approach is serum osmolality, and that's most likely going to be low. Second, you're going to do a volume status assessment. Hypovolemia needs to be treated with IV normal saline, and you can do a urine sodium to figure out if the kidneys are functioning properly. Then there's euvolemia. You need to remember the causes of SIADH and also the non-SIADH mechanisms. Treatment is management of the underlying disorder and also fluid restriction. And then we have hypervolemia. Uh, just remember the differential. And again, the treatment is fluid restriction. For management, determine if it's acute or chronic, monitor it really frequently, and avoid CPM at all costs. All right, so we're done. Um, as always, click on the buttons um, you'll see pop up on the screen here. If you want to jump back to a specific section of the video, uh, please subscribe to my channel if you want to see more of these videos, and email me at approach2internalmedicine at gmail.com if you have any questions. And thanks for watching.